One of the first glimpses we all got of what we're now experiencing came as passengers from cruise ships were repatriated into quarantine at the Canadian Forces Base in Trenton. Patricia Monroe was one of the registered nurses who stepped up to help. She is a professor and coordinator of the practical nursing program at Loyalist College, and she joins us now via Skype from her home in Quinty West, Ontario. Patricia, uh, not only are we delighted to have you join us, but I understand this is your first ever sort of TV interview, although we don't see each other here, just virtually. So uh, we're grateful you made time for us and that you decided to make us your first. How are you managing through all this? I'm good, thank you. Glad to hear it. You were recently working with quarantine patients, as we suggested, who were evacuated from the cruise ships. Uh, just off the top, what was that experience like for you? Um, humbling, <laughs> humbling, and I was very grateful to do it. And it was, um, it was a strange way to be in our healthcare system right now. Strange in what way? Well, we've never. Most of us nurses have never nursed through a pandemic. I mean, most of us have nursed through SARS, and that was um, trying as well. But this was different in the case that we were, you're completely um, in professional practice, or sorry, in um, personal protective um, equipment. So you can't see each other. You can't see the person that you're looking at. You have to nurse using your eyes and your voice only. And that's um, challenging when you're a very um, tactile person, which most of us are as nurses. And um, so you had to really pull forward a new skill set. So let's just clarify that because I, I gather you couldn't touch the patients at all. Is that right? That's correct. Hmm. So how do you actually, how do you provide care in an appropriate fashion if you can't do what you normally do? Well, nursing is not just hands-on. Nursing is um, providing psychosocial care, right? It's, it's um, a big part of nursing is counseling and emotional uh, care and doing assessments. And using our questioning and our interview techniques, you can gather quite a bit of information um, based on, and typically you can do it based on body language and facial expression, but of course we couldn't see facial expression. But you use an infrared thermometer to check the, thermo um, the temperature of the person so you're not touching them. And then you go through a series of questions that you would ask each person. Uh, it's the same as what they're doing in the hospital now, and it's the same what they're doing at the airports. And that would be the assessment that you would do on every single person um, twice a day. Now, let me just make sure I've got the math right here, because I think at first the, the assumption was that nobody had COVID-19 out of all of the people aboard the ship that you were dealing with. But then what was it? As many as 10 cases eventually came back positive. Is that right? Um, so I can't really talk about the specifics of the um, the people that were there, but anybody can go on to the um, Dr. Teresa Tam site and it will it has the published numbers. So yes, in the beginning, um, so we had three different um, we had three different um, times that were there. So we had the the first phase was in Trenton, and then the second phase was in uh, where was that? That was in Cornwall, and there were no cases. And then the third one was in Trenton. And yes, we do have um, published cases. So <laughs> you definitely anybody can look that up. I'm just not going to sort of um, say exactly how many. No, I appreciate it. You, you, you have to take an abundance of care as it relates to the privacy of the patients and so on. So I, I get that. But I guess what I'm driving at here is how much, when you knew that you were dealing with X number of patients who were testing positive for COVID-19, how much did you worry about your own safety at that matter? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I certainly did go through my head. Of course it did. But I also felt I was, um, <clears throat> I was contracted through Public Health Canada, and I felt extremely safe with them. I felt that everybody was taking the right precautions. We had epidemiologists there, we had quarantine officers there, all registered nurses. Um, the, the, the certainly CFB Trenton, it was amazing. I have never felt so safe in nursing in my life. They uh, provided us with everything we need. We felt that, um, again, it, it was just, it was an ideal situation in terms of everybody working together, pulling together, watching out for each other. So I didn't really worry. I probably, it was probably upon reflection that I thought more about it than when I was actually in the situation. Hmm. So n never any issues regarding personal protective equipment, that kind of thing? Not there, but there's a lot of issues that are out there for all of my colleagues right now who are working in the hospitals and it breaks my heart.
Yes, no, we're definitely hearing lots of stories about that. But uh, OK, let me take a step back here. You um, you teach nursing at Loyalist College, as we suggested, in Belleville, Ontario. How long have you been doing uh, teaching nursing? Uh, let's see. I, I think 12 years full time. And then a couple of years before that, I was a clinical teacher and I've been a nurse for a long time. <laughs> OK, how do you teach nursing when no one's in class? Oh, okay, that's the biggest challenge right now. And certainly with the students, we've had to, Loyalist College, I got to do a shout out to Loyalist College because they're phenomenal. We have a wonderful president there, Anne-Marie Vaughn, and I've got a great boss, June McDonald Jenkins, who's, um, and it's, what they have done is provided us with online supports. And what we're doing is teaching, well, literally I'll be teaching later today through this same medium, and my students will all log on and sign on. It's challenging, and I would say that the first part of your class, you spend the first half hour basically talking about how is everybody feeling emotionally. My priorities have switched, and my priorities are how is everybody feeling emotionally? Does everybody feel safe? And then we try to get into some uh, teaching and learning. And I feel like for the students, they feel connected with us, and it's been a saving grace for them as well as for myself under social isolation. Okay, but but you know, at some point the rubber's got to hit the road. And I mean, you, how do you teach a nurse how to uh, give a blood test or how to give a needle or how to put an IV in when everything's virtual nowadays? Yeah, that's um, that's challenging. So what we're doing is we're continuing on with our theory courses. So it would mean that you know, teaching about critical thinking, in terms of the hands-on, that obviously we cannot do right now. There are a number of um, case studies that we can use. There's a number of virtual platforms that we can use that students can engage with. Um, we've always been using simulation. Uh, one of our things at Loyalists is that we're known for our simulation center. And so most of our faculty is trained in using high fidelity simulation. So we've just had to change our skill set and use what we have available to us online for the students. But yes, it will be challenging. We'll have to add um, a few of those things probably back into the fall when we can go back into the hospitals, because right now we're not in the hospitals. Right. Now, are there are there students who would be graduating sort of, uh, well, I guess convocation season is May and June. Are, are there students who, who will be graduating right now that you might have some concerns that they're not as well prepared for whatever awaits them as uh, they might otherwise be? Well, we actually just, um, I would say that I'm not concerned they won't be prepared because I think we do prepare our students. We probably over prepare our students. However, I think they won't, I think that, well, I'll say this, we just had a, a class graduate and they literally just got hired a week before everything happened. And so certainly I think about them. I try to stay connected with that group of graduates so that we can try to provide some support for them. To graduate into a pandemic is something that none of us have experienced. So we don't have that um you know that experience and all we can do is try to stay connected with them. We have a group that will that would typically be graduating at the end of June. And I'm not sure what's going to happen in terms of whether students are going to be allowed to go back into the hospital. Um, we're just waiting to hear about all of that. Hmm. Now, of course, in, in some university settings, the students graduate and they, you know, it takes a while to get that first job. I, I gather for your students, I mean, they're going to be, uh, I mean, the demand is going to be immediate and it's going to be intense. And, um, you know, again, I wonder whether or not your your students who are just about to graduate and get snapped up and get thrown right into the midst of this crisis, whether you feel they are they are ready for what awaits them out there? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, I, I would say that I would say that nobody can be prepared for what awaits you out there, but I would say also that using good communication skills, using um, banking on their critical thinking that they've learned at the school, I do believe that they are prepared. I think emotionally they have each other. I do believe that us staying connected with them, every single one of them has been hired. Hmm. Every single one. Well, that's so the good news. Yes. Now, the other side of the equation is, how scared do you think they are? They're terrified. Terrified, but they're eh? still yeah, but they're still going in. Of course they are. Every nurse is. Every medical person is. But you try, when you go in there, you have each other, you look out for each other. People are afraid for their families and for the patients, not necessarily afraid for themselves. 
I think that when you become a healthcare worker, it's a calling and each one of us know what we're getting into. We certainly didn't plan for this and nobody wants to get sick. That's not the goal. Hmm. What advice have you given them to kind of deal with this baptism by fire that they're about to face? It's a great question. So I have a little group of them that I do talk to. I say, I just tell them to stay connected with us faculty so that we can listen to their concerns. Um, we tell them to be safe, to think about the principles that we've taught them about infection control to the best of our abilities to protect their families. We know that in our local area, certainly um, most of my fellow teachers are on the front lines right now. I mean, I nursed with another girl, um, Nikki Armstrong, she, she nursed with me. Another one, um, I'm gonna call out a few people, but another one, Suzanne uh, Lynch Braithwaite, she's trying to develop some prototype. Uh, she wants to be out there nursing. Every, all the clinical teachers are out there nursing on the front lines right now. And most of them are thinking about, they've already divided their households. So some are living in the basement, some have moved out, some have sent their children away. So socially, it's everybody's stepping up and doing what they can. Hmm. Now, what stories are you hearing back from them about how much personal protective equipment and other things that you would presumably need to stay safe yourself in their new settings? I would say that nurses are, they always maintain confidentiality. So I'm not hearing a lot of stories beyond what you're gonna hear on the news and everything in terms of any nurse that's been interviewed on the news, um, it is absolutely true. There isn't enough protective equipment yet. We're hoping that it's gonna be coming. Um, it's very challenging because how we trained our students is to use the best infection control with everything you can. Right now we're in a pandemic, nobody expected it. I hope more masks are coming. I hope more, I just hope that more PPE is coming for all of the frontline workers. I worry about the frontline workers because everybody is working quite hard. I worry about their sleep. I worry about their emotional state. I think people can get sick, uh, you know, with the psychosocial uh, impact of this. Mm. Well, at the risk of stating the obvious, there's no way you can help us stay well if you yourselves can't stay well. And I right. wonder, you know, you, you, I, I know that, you know, nurses and doctors, particularly at this time, are very driven to to help their patients and to do a good job. D do you worry that they disregard their own personal, you know, an adequate night's sleep, uh, making sure they get a chance to exercise a bit or, you know, take care of themselves? Do you worry they're not doing that right now and, and getting too run down? Um, I'm not worried. The people that I'm in direct contact with, everybody is be very focused on that, is very aware of that. I would say that people are trying their best to use home gyms, do whatever they can. Um, it's the stress and the fallout from it. Um, another thing I would like to say is, um, and I'm, I'm just going to put it out there, is I think that all the hospitals need to make it free parking for all medical care people because it's, it floors me. I've got students who've been hired to work at all the different hospitals and they should not have to pay for parking during this time. I'd love hmm. to see all the hospitals make it just blank of free parking. These people are going in to look after your loved ones. They are becoming the family members for everybody. So I would really like to see a movement like that. Okay. Well, you've got the word out there. Let's see if anybody picks up on that. That's a neat idea. Tell me this, is there anything that has um, surprised you in particular, either professionally or personally over the last three weeks as you've watched this pandemic grab hold, uh, obviously not just here, but around the world? I would say that um, I, and maybe I've got my rose color glasses on, but I'm amazed at the acts of humanity. In my community alone, our school uh, donated all kinds of PPE to the local hospital. I have seen businesses step up. I have seen people reach out. I have seen, I have one friend, somebody dropped a trailer off at her house for her. So I'm just amazed at how the community has pulled together. I am I live in a, a military town and I've always noticed that. So I'm very proud of being um, associated with CFB Trenton as well. And I think that we have a great town and I think people are pulling together and being so kind. I'm glad to hear that. I do want to ask about the other side of the equation though. And, and that is um, certainly, I mean, we live, those of us who work uh, at TVO work in Toronto and we work in a dense environment and we, you know, I've checked in with colleagues and, and there are still 
too many people who are disregarding the admonitions of the public health officials in this province. They're still gathering in too large numbers. They're not so, uh, adequately physically distancing themselves from other people when they go for walks or whatever. Um, we still see some of that. How about in the less densely populated part of the province in which you live? What are you seeing in that regard? I actually haven't seen that down here. So I go for a walk each day and I have noticed, I haven't seen any, well, every single person I've seen is socially distancing. I have not seen crowds gathered. I know I'm in a smaller town, so I haven't had that experience myself. I try not to judge others on this. I think all behavior has meaning. All nurses think that way. Um, I think it's a very difficult situation. I think it's really easy to be judge and jury. Um, I don't know what's going on in everybody else's life and, and what motivates them. I do think that it's a huge, it can be a huge mental health crisis when people are so isolated. So I'm trying really hard to suspend judgment. Well, okay, trying hard to suspend judgment, but you are a nurse. You're a healthcare professional, and I wonder if ever when you're out on your walks, if you see people who aren't practicing uh, the kind of protocols they're supposed to be now, do you ever go up to them and say, hey, I'm a nurse. You're making this uh, tough on the rest of us here. Smarten up. Do you ever do that? Um, I'm not sure that would be the wisest move, <laughs> but... <laughs> um, I Honestly, I haven't seen anybody doing that myself. And, and, I, and it could be because I'm in a smaller town. It could be because I'm socially isolated myself. I really haven't seen that. I have seen things on the news. Um, and it, yes, absolutely, it concerns me because I know that the virus needs a host and I know that it jumps from you know, person to person. But I can't really comment on things that I haven't seen myself um, personally. No, for sure. But what, what, what's the stupidest thing you've seen so far? First thing that popped into my head was seeing all those kids on March break in Florida on the beaches. And, and I just thought to myself, you know, these are obviously people of, of an age who think they're invulnerable anyway. Uh, but they're clearly not thinking about what they might bring home to their parents and grandparents after that. That's still stuck in my head. I don't know if you've got an incident like that in your head. Well, you know what? I I can't take my nursing hat off. And I, I all I can think about is their frontal lobe is not fully developed. So I totally expect <laughs> that. And that, 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 that's pretty normal for, you know, up to age 25 for people to do things that, you know, might not. I think it's not. I think it's abnormal times. Like I said, I try not to judge anyone for what they are doing. Um, I think that the advice that I would give people is right now is if they can stop smoking or stay away from inhaling any products because they need their lungs to be well. I'd love to see people eating well. I'd love to see people maintaining some kind of exercise. I do think it is important to get outside. It, of course, maintaining social distancing. I hope that people are checking up on each other. I would like to see people, this may not be popular to you, I'd like to see people not watching the news. I would like to see people <laughs> using the uh, public health uh, site, Dr. Tam, use her, her site Twitter for their data so they're getting the right information. Um, use the WHO. I'd like people to concentrate on more of the positive. The reality is, and I can't quote the numbers, but 80% of people are doing well. So I think we have to remember that. Um, I'd like to see people maybe not come into the hospital as much if they can look after themselves at home, uh, make sure they're getting adequate fluids. I think those are really important things to do. I will offer a friendly amendment to that, which is to say, how about if you're gonna consume media, make sure it's a reliable and credible source. <laughs> can we agree on that much? We can agree on that as long as you give a shout out to Public Health Canada, because they're doing such a great job. You just did. Patricia Monroe, it's really good of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Good luck and thanks for everything you're doing. Oh, thank you for having me and um, stay safe. Thank you. Back at you. Bye. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.